all that they do as far as our music, and we're still working on some stuff in our music department, so don't give up on me yet. Romans chapter 12 is a very familiar chapter in the Bible. And I want to take the time this morning to read it. And for those of you, this might be your first time here. Uh, I just want to let you know I never get finished with a message in one setting. It always has a tendency to be thematic. And I kindly somehow get into a, a vein and run it until I preach it all the way out. And that might be kindly what we do this morning with starting this particular message. But before I read this, it's different. And Romans 12 starts in a different manner than what it ends. So it ties together because it's all in the same chapter. And Paul is writing this and he's asking as he opens this up, as he says there in verses 1 and 2, that we be the people of God in all that we do, in our actions, in our deeds, in our works, in all mannerisms of our life, in all of our self-control, in the way we act and the way we react and the way we conduct ourselves publicly, privately, in and around others. You think, well, that's a whole lot to open up with this morning. That's a, that's a whole lot of stuff. And it is. And before you read the latter part of Romans chapter number 12, as I read this, and as I've read through this, I once again come to the reality of how much we need God in our life to be able to live the life that God intends us to live as Christians. And that is why Paul was writing this in verse number 1. Because he was teaching us to be submissive to our Father God. And Paul writes this, and he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. When we have talked about that verse in so many days gone by, we had a tendency to hit the period where there's a comma. And the reason I said that is because we often stop on certain ideologies and certain things and think that we can check the box that we've aced that and that we have done everything that God would have us to do, such as, in days gone by, we talked about hair, makeup, jewelry, and attire. All of that can be very much a part of holiness, and all of that can be a part of our conduct. But yet in all reality, where Paul's going with the end of this, is just as much a part of our daily conduct as the things that we have looked at in days gone by and feel as if we have achieved a certain level of success with God. Now, I know that's a lot. Verse number two, he teaches us, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, seriously, honestly, according to, uh, as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. That is very important that you hear that. So we being many are one body in Christ and every and every one members of one another having then gifts different according to the grace that is given unto us. Whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth let him do it 
with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Verse number 9 says, let love be without dissimulation. In other words, pretend. Don't let it just be pretend. Let it be genuine. Let it just be truly from the depth of your heart. He says, abhor that which is evil. Now, we don't use that word. I've never used that word in a sentence in my life. But it's here in the King James, the word abhor, many would say, well, what in the world does that mean? That word abhor actually means to shudder in horror. In other words, he says, shudder in horror or abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, uh, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patience, and tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. 16 and following is where we're taking this from today. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but can, can, uh, can descend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place, but rather give place under wrath, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy be hungry, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Verse 21, as we used to say in Sunday school, the golden text of the morning, where he says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I want you to stretch your hand this way and pray for me this morning. Father, I do thank you. I thank you for everything that's been said and everything that's been done. I pray, Father, that as I felt this being laid upon my heart, Lord, I pray, God, that you, Father God, would help me to share the things that I believe that, Lord, you've laid on my heart. Father, I pray, God, that even right now, that you would, Lord, anoint me for this time and this hour and for this purpose. That, God, that the words that I would speak today, God, that they would be from heaven and not just from me. That, God, that they would be words from your word that, that would go forth. Father, I thank you, God, for the blessed Holy Spirit that helps us in all that we endeavor to do. And, God, we give you glory and praise and honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. If you go back to verse number one, you can see how that Paul opens this scripture. And Paul opens the scripture by simply saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Look at verse 21. And then he says, And be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So the question that is before us today and the way that I wrote this and the way I felt it as I was writing these notes before me today is what do you do when you get knocked down? What do you do in this life when it seems like that everything around you continues to knock you down? It seems like that when I was working through this, that I, I did not have any particular situation 
in my mind, and I certainly didn't have any particular person in my mind when I was writing this, but I thought to myself that God knows who's here and God knows who needs to hear what's being said. So I simply take the position today as a delivery boy, if you will, only to deliver what I felt like that God had put in my heart for the moment. When we think about what do you do when you get knocked down? Somebody's already said it. I begin to think about a boxer. I begin to think about those. And I don't typically watch boxing. It's a little bit too brutal for me. Uh, but, but, but when a boxer's on the mat, a wrestler's on the mat, there's a referee or a guy standing in the, ca- the corner and he's, he's counting with the box and he counts and he looks at the guy and he makes sure his equilibrium in one eye is lined back up with the other eye. He either counts him out or he puts him back in the fight. I used to watch wrestling. Some of you did too. I mean, we'd ho- holler and hoot all over the living room and we, we would remember uh, all these wrestler guys and all these big guys way back in the day and they'd, they'd have them down. I, I thought it was so real, Brother Mike. I thought it was real, real, real. But they'd, they'd get them guys down, Brother Stephen. They'd get them down one, two, and somehow or another, he got that shoulder up. I don't know how they done it, but he got that shoulder up. So the fight was not over. And I think sometimes in this whole world that we're living in that there's so many people today that's been knocked down. And you feel like that you, 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 you are almost to that point where you don't know if you can get back up. I remember reading, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing because simply I don't have time to do all that today. But I remember reading in the, in the scripture about a young man, his name was Joseph. You know it over in the Old Testament there. And Joseph was one of those guys that could have very easily found reason in his heart to avenge himself against the person who had done him wrong. They waited for Joseph and his brothers threw him off into a pit. There was a band of individuals come by and they took him out and they thought that Joseph was dead. They took the kid's blood and put it on over and they went back and reported to Joseph's dad that he had died. But yet something that God had planned in Joseph's life, Joseph's life, and you know the whole story, they took him and they put him there in the house of Potiphar, if you will, and he was restored and he went from the pit all the way to the palace. And I said that, well, I said that to say this, that one of the greatest examples of forgiveness in the Old Testament is Joseph. Even through the famine and everything that went into that story along with Joseph, when his brothers was famine, when his brothers had went down and they didn't have anything to eat. Years later, Joseph was the very one that was able to feed the very ones that had put him in the pit. So how do we, do, how, how do we deal with this in the... The world that we're living in today, first of all, we've got to understand, and I, I believe this with everything within me, it's not your fight. It's God's fight. God, the Bible said, vengeance is the Lord's, and the Bible said that God will repay. So God's concern when he wrote this, when Paul was writing this, is that there be unity among the believers. Even though I believe this within my heart, I still hear things from time to time. From time to time, I still hear people talking about people. From time to time, I still hear people putting one another down. From time to time, I still hear people looking at somebody else's speck of sawdust in in their their neighbor's eye when they've got a two-by-four sticking out of their eye. And when I thought about this, I thought about how are we ever going to lift one another up when we keep knocking one another down? You say, well, preacher, is something going on that, that we don't know about? Look at me real close. No. No. But I believe if there's anything that the enemy could do to disrupt a body of Christ, the church, he would do anything and everything he could do to tear a church down. As a pastor, I call this maintenance. 
As a pastor, I call this all in the machine. As a pastor, I call, I call this keeping us flowing in the right direction, if you will. So when Paul was writing this, as Paul was writing for us to, to yield our bodies as a living sacrifice, it's kind of ironic that Paul wrote this all in one chapter. And the first thing that we, we, we begin to see is that Paul was writing as we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Paul, through this writing, was teaching you and I how we, as the body of Christ, a living sacrifice, are to treat one another. Because he reminds us in the latter part of this that we are not to recompense evil for evil. So what do we do in this? First of all, we look at this in the Scripture. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is found here in the Word of God. We see the where the Bible says in verse number 10 of this text, He says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Say this with me. Be kind. So what is Paul saying to the body of Christ? He says, as you have lent your body to Christ, and as you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, as a living sacrifice, not to knock one another down, Paul was saying to them that you've got to be kind one to another. Now look at your neighbor and smile real big at them. Those people next to you are not your enemies today. The people around you today are not your enemies today. And the Bible teaches us that we are to love, excuse me, that we are to be kind one to another. We've got a banner on our back that says, Christian, we are to be kind, the Bible says. Uh, Colossians chapter number 3 is another verse of Scripture that picks up on this. And we pick up in verse number 12 through 17. And this is what, again, Paul was writing to the church there. The Colossian church in verse 12. And when he writes this, he says it like this. Put, put on therefore the elect of God, elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. He tells us to be merciful. What does that mean today? Mercy is... If we look at mercy the way I understand mercy, is God not giving you what you truly do deserve? When Paul was writing this, and Paul was writing this to the church, and he tells us the bowels of mercy, what Paul was saying is you do not give people what they truly do deserve, but you give them mercy. Now let me put a little note right here that's not in my notes. I'm not trying to make any provision for sin in this message. I'm not trying to say, let people run all over you and stomp you on the ground. I'm not trying to say that. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord. That we're admonished of God, and I'll get into that latter part later. That we are admonished of God to put on the bowels of mercy. This is not a Bible verse, but it's a Bible principle. The Bible principle is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Bottom line, treat other people exactly how you want other people to treat you. As you treat people one way, you're really telling them, this is how I want you to treat me. Hello, somebody. And he teaches us that we're to be kind right here. Kindness. Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now you can read. I'm going to go real fast right here. Verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And you know what that really means in the Greek context? It means as Christ has forgiven you, even so you also should forgive one another. That's what it means. It means that you are to forgive and I am to forgive. Somebody says, well, I'll get somebody back if it's the very last breath I draw. I will get them back. I got a word from heaven for you. You need to get saved. 
You need to get born again. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost uh, and with the power of God because that attitude and that action is not of God. It is straight out of the pits of you know where. And today, my friend, God is simply telling the church that we've got to be kindly affectionate, be merciful. And if you have a quarrel against any, there's another whole section of Scripture that goes along with that. Matthew 18 that I didn't prepare for this particular time. Go to the person and settle it and talk about it. Make, make sure you got everything right between you and the Lord and that person. Matthew 18. Go read it sometime. Even so as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 14, real fast. And above all these things, put on love, put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. Go ahead. And he says in 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, that, you, that, that the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Verse 16. And let the word of, word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, building up, encouraging one another, admonishing one another in the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Verse 17, he says, And whatsoever you do, indeed do all in the name of the Lord, uh, giving thanks to God uh, and the Father by Him. So when we look at these scriptures, the several things uh, that came to my mind, several things come to my, my heart when I was doing this. First of all, he says love. Above all things, love. Then what about honor? Honor, respect for, uh, for those around you. Then putting others first. Somewhere years ago, I seen it in one of the... Um, I think it was one of our directories or something that when I first came here, it was in there. And to this day, I still remember it. There's a little word in that directory. Kay will probably remember where it's at. And it says joy. You can have joy. What is joy? How do you get the acronym for joy? It was in that little bu printed bulletin for all the pitch pictorial years ago. First of all, you get joy by having Jesus. And then joy, J O I, joy is Jesus, others, and yourself. And I remember that when I first came here. So when we look at this, the scripture here this morning, we think about what God is saying in the Word, in the book of Romans. Again, He teaches us be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So the second thing I thought about is. Not only do we need to be kind and be affectionate. This is a big one. Fasten your seatbelt. Second thing is simply this. Slow to anger. Now, I don't know if you've got an anger problem or not. Nobody's told me about anybody here in the church who's got an anger problem. But I know a couple of years ago, I found myself slipping. She knows it. I found myself slipping. I was getting more bitter and, and more bitter and, and I was getting angrier and angrier and things around me and situations and circumstances. And I read a book years ago, Tommy Barnett, at, at, which is in Phoenix First Assembly in Arizona. He preached in 1996 and I remember it to this day. In the message that he preached there this day and he was telling us all kinds of things uh, that happened in his life in ministry where he could have grown more bitter and more hurt, more hurted, that ain't even a word, more hurt towards people. But yet Tommy decided as a pastor that he was going to get better instead of bitter. And you might be here today. I don't know who's listening. I don't know what you're dealing with. I have no idea. You might be dealing with things in your life right now that you've really been ticked off over. And today you have a choice of either remaining in the state that you're in right now or you can find yourself getting better by the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed when people get bitter and don't get mad at the preacher, they get mouthy? They just, I'm just telling you personal experience. When they get bitter, they get mouthy. And when they get mouthy, they just can't wait to tell somebody else what's happened to them so that they can begin to rally their troops on their side so that they can have a little reinforcement in their corner so they would somehow have a license in some way to be bitter and they get other people in their corner. But see, James teaches us about wisdom. 
James, the book of James, when you begin to look in the book of James, James chapter number one, again, it's quite a bit of reading here this morning and I don't know how much time I will be able to get into every bit of this, but James actually teaches us this in verse number 19 and this is very imperative that we hear this. He says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Then, what does he say? He says, he says, slow to speak. Everything you hear is not for you to repeat. And everything you hear is not the truth. I heard a story one time of a preacher. No, it wasn't just a story. It was a true story. A good, close pastor friend of mine years ago. I'll even tell you his name, Jim Bolin. He pastored the Trinity Chapel in Georgia. Large church. At that time, three, four, five thousand people. And Jim told a story about how that somebody had seen him coming out of the jail about 6 a.m. in the morning. And then whoever seen him went and told somebody else that the pastor had spent the night in jail. <laughs> that they seen him early in the morning coming out of the jailhouse. Well, he did walk out of the courthouse and he was in the jailhouse. But by the time it got told, it got told that he himself had been arrested and he himself had been put in jail overnight. But they did not know that he had went down to the jailhouse to get a member's child out of jail and to be there with that member's child overnight. So you can't believe everything you hear. But we are so prone to speak it. We may not even know. I remember on the youth board years ago, Randy Paris, our youth director, when we were on the youth board, he said, listen, he said, if you deal with anything at the youth camp, he said, make sure you hear the whole story before you develop an opinion about the matter. And you see, again, this is maintenance today. This is all in the machine today. If we're going to have love and unity for the brethren and the sisters in the church, the Bible teaches us in James, as James begins to write this, he said, you've got to be swift to hear, but you've got to, slow to, uh, you've got to be uh, slow to speak and slow to wrath. Wrath actually means rage. When you think about this, when you think about this right here, we can see in verse 20, For the wrath of man worketh not unrighteousness, but, but uh, righteousness of God. And then he says, Let us lay aside all filthiness and superfluity, overflowing and naughtiness, if you will, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, uh, which is able to save your souls. Then he says in verse 22, he says here in the word, he says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word uh, and not a doer of the word, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. And then he he talks about verse 24 for he both beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was verse 25 but but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein he he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this man shall be blessed in all of his deeds and then you know he goes on and he says that if any man seem among you uh, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue. That's amazing. That's, in, that's even in the word of God. He said he bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. His man's religion is in vain. Now I said that to say this. We've got to watch what comes out of our mouth. Life and death lies in the power of of our tongue. We can build somebody up and we can tear somebody down with our mouth. In the Bible, again, when we think about this, he teaches us that we've read in this text today not to return evil for evil. Not to do that. Proverbs 16. We're going to read a few Proverbs here real quick. Proverbs chapter 16 and 32 says it like this. This is the word that gives us wisdom from Proverbs. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. 
And he that ruleth his spirit, then he that taketh a city. In other words, you might be mighty and strong and be able to take a city. But he says, but if you're not able to guard your mouth and control your mouth, really, he says that you are weak and that it takes a whole lot to gird your mouth and to guard your mouth. Hey, I know this is not my normal way. I don't know why I'm preaching this. It's just what I felt like God laid on my heart. But it will help us not to destroy one another if we take adherence to the Word of God. It's not our job, folks. It's not our job to tear one another down. And nobody does that that I know of. It's not our job to hurt one another. Could you imagine all the hurt that's in our world today? Could you imagine all the pain that's in our world today? And the last place that somebody needs to be torn down is in the house of God among those that are supposed to love them. We're to love one another. We're not always going to agree together. I like, hey, I bought two boxes of ice cream yesterday. Two boxes. Why? Because I like vanilla. I like vanilla bean ice cream. Guess what? Sherry likes chocolate. We're not the same, even though I ate a bite of it. Everybody, we're not always going to see eyeball to eyeball. I mean, some people like, you know, roller coasters. I promise you, you'll never get me on a roller coaster. I promise you that. Man, my equilibrium and my vertigo, I'd walk sideways for a month if I got on one of them things. I ain't doing it. Everybody's different. But there's one thing we need to agree on, and that is how we love one another. Are we okay today? Lord, help me. He says again in the Word, again, when you look at the, the Proverbs, Proverbs uh, chapter number 15, verse 1, we open up with this, and there's about seven verses I'm going to try to get through really, really fast. And this is what he says in Proverbs 15 and 1. He said, A soft answer turneth away wrath. Grievous words stir up anger. Can I tell you that sometimes the best thing you can do, and it's not weakness, it's wisdom. The best thing you can do when you run into a person and all they want to do is have an argument with you. All they want to do is stir up your dander. All they want to do is see how far they can push you. The best thing you can do is walk away from them. Jesus told those that would not hear the gospel message uh, as they would go into a city. What did Jesus say? He said, if they will not hear the gospel, he did not say stand there and ball up your fist and hit them in the eye. He did not say that. He said, shake the very dust uh, from your feet off against them that it'll be more horrible for them in the day uh, of judgment than for Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not your place. But God said, in the word, if you look at this, a soft answer. That it, again, when you look at this word, a soft answer, when you look at that in detail, what it really means uh, is to be tender hearted. It's hard for us to feel sorry for our enemies. But some people, I'm telling you what's the truth, I can't help but just feel plumb sorry for them. I mean, they're sinners. They don't know any difference sometimes. They're just... Plain old sinners. I remember a time when I was in the jailhouse. Not there as a person that was locked up. But we were doing ministry and I'd never seen a jail in my life. And we had went in and there was a guy there inside. And Brother Michael, he was there and, and I was there with a group of other preachers and we was trying to testify to him and Brother West, that guy was mocking us. We were trying to share the word, and he was in the background mocking us. Pulled his t-shirt up over his head as to say, I don't want to hear a word you got to say. And then Pastor Tony, he's passed away now, and he was there ministering to these guys and ministering to these guys. And I'm thinking, you know what? A bunch of dummies in here. I thought, now that's me thinking. You wouldn't think like that, but I do. I thought, you bunch of dummies in here. I mean, here we are trying to help you. Here we are trying to bring hope to your life. And we're trying to bring hope and salvation to you. Sometimes we just feel sorry for you. We want to, people today, they just want to be vindictive. And they want to vendetta against somebody else. 
We can't do that. Jesus reminded us that, that we're the light of the world, salt of the earth. He says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Look in verse 2. Grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Hello? He said, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. People can identify themselves plainly as righteousness or wise when they open up their mouth. And you know what? I've seen too many church people in my days act just like that right there. Hello? I knew it wasn't going to be a lot of amens and shouting hallelujahs this morning, but it's okay. We're going to get through it together. We're going to get through it. Your personal conduct is important in the world by which we're living in. How many of you have ever heard this old cliche? Well, if that's a Christian going right there, buddy, I sure don't want to be one. Hello. Y'all might as well shake your little heads at me because you know it's the truth. We've all heard that. But the sad thing about it is too many times the world was looking at us and they were saying, if that's a Christian right there. See, I know that's a little rough this morning, but I want to be that that God would be pleased with. Look at the rest of these verses really, really quick. Then I got to get out of here. I got to drive about an hour and a half. Verse, am I in three or four? The eyes of the Lord are on the the every place, beholding the evil and the good. God sees it all. God knows it all. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue. James said it's set on fire of hell and no man can tame it. It takes the Holy Ghost to tame it. You can't do it on your own. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is the breach in the spirit. A few more verses. Look at this. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Six. He says, in the house of righteousness is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. One more verse. He says, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. What is coming out of your lips? But the heart of the foolish doeth not so. In other words, he says, there's no wisdom that comes out of the heart of the foolish. When you think about this, and I think about it as well, there's a couple of verses of Scripture that's found. I think I'm going to go to Proverbs, excuse me, Psalms 19 and verse number 14. One of the most favorite verses of all days. This is very important. He says again in our text, render not evil for evil and recompense no man for evil. See, I don't know why I preach this. I have no clue. Somebody in this room, maybe you have dealt with somebody this week and you knew that it was straight out of the pits of hell when they attacked you. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I can't wait till Monday morning because I had already planned in my mind to get them back. Maybe Tuesday, maybe Wednesday, maybe Thursday, maybe Friday. I don't know. But here's what the Holy Ghost sent me by long enough to tell you today. Let it go and shine. Just go in, square your shoulders, uh, and be the person that God uh, wants you to be. And I promise you that God uh, will be your revenger. I pray, I I know that God uh, will recompense. I know that God will get the last amen, and you won't have to do a thing. Look in this word, verse 14. He says, let the words of my mouth, uh, let the words of my mouth, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and and my Redeemer. In all that I do, in all the actions uh, that is before me, let God be pleased with who I am and what I do. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. Again, it only tends to evil. That is in Psalm 37 and 8. Proverbs 14 and 29, the Bible says, Whosoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. That's not the King James, but Proverbs 1. Again, we've already read that in Proverbs 15. Here's a scripture I want to read, that I want to end with. Not that I'm finished, I just have to end. Proverbs 25 and 11. So the next time you get knocked down, anybody remember those little weebles wobble, but they won't fall down? 
the younger kids don't remember. Older kids remember. They came out in 1969 and they sold them all the way up through 81 or somewhere like that. Little figurines, little, little animal figurines, people figurines. They were egg-shaped, little, little, little toy, and they would wobble, but they wouldn't fall down. Sometimes we've got to be res resilient. I guess that's the right word. Resilient. Life's that way, ain't it, Sandra? We just have to get back up. Treat one another with love. Love one another. Honor one another. Respect one another. We can't recompense evil for evil. We've got to understand that it's God that says vengeance is His and he will, he will repay and just let God do it. Last verse. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. I woke up early this morning. That's all that's going through my mind. I added that verse in because I could imagine in days gone by how that I've seen that verse and actually photographs and it would have these apples of gold setting in a fragrance of silver. He says, your words are golden, like golden apples. With your words, you build up. And with your words, you tear down. Your words either build or they destruct. They hurt. So when you leave this room today, even though if somebody says something sharp to you. The Bible says to pray for them. In so doing, it's like heaping coals of fire upon their head. Studying this a long time ago, one of the ways that they would bring judgment upon an enemy or punishment upon an enemy, they would take hot, fiery coals and they would put it in a container. And then the individuals would have to carry that container above their head and they would feel that fiery heat upon the tops of their head as a reminder of the injustices that they had done against someone else. And God says, when you don't return evil for evil, when you just keep on loving them, that it's like heaping that coal, that fire coal upon their head. Hey, they're expecting you to fight. They want to fight. But what God says to you and I is, as you love them, as you pray for them, as you're good to them, He said, it's just like a coal of fire upon their head. And it's a reminder, well, they are Christians. They are walking out the Scripture. They are loving. And you know what? By that, all men shall know that you are my disciples as you love one another. Now, let me go back to this in closing. You're not a doormat. I'm not a doormat. There's Ecclesiastes says there's even a time for war. There's a time for peace. But the war part is when you see the injustices of society being done. And we as the church are to, I guess the word I'm looking for, defend the righteous as we approach the darkness. We have a right to say, what's right and what's wrong. But I do believe there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Well, there's my message for today. I've got to skedaddle here in just a few minutes. I want you to stand with me. Father, we do love you today and thank you, God. We thank you for your amazing grace that God that you have bestowed upon all of us, your people. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your graciousness, God. The God that you have shared upon us, your people. And Father, I pray, God, that even now, that God, the, your word, not my word, but your word that's been revealed in this place today, Lord, let it go forth and let it speak to every heart into every life. And God, help us to become even more so today than ever before the people of God. That the glorious light of the gospel would shine forth to every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. Father, as every head is bowed and 
people are thinking about what's been said even right now. Father, I pray, God, that there be those that's in this room that's been hurt, hurt by others. People are so mean sometimes and people are cruel sometimes. And Lord, you said in your word that we could cast every care upon you for you careth for us. And Father, the pain and the anguish that folks may be experiencing in this room today. Lord, I do not make light of it. I do not. Lord, it's painful. But Lord, let them know today that you are the burden bearer. And that God, that you can carry this. And Father, we ask God that you just tender every heart. God, that you would minister to every heart. And Lord, I do pray for us as a church that we would be tender-hearted, long-suffering, that God, that we would be walking in the bowels of mercy and that God, that we would edify one another and build one another up. And Father, we ask you this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Hope you have a good day. Be blessed. We'll see you soon. Amen.